So the report that we're talking about, Thomson Reuters uh, Institute has published a report. It's the 2023 Corporate Gl- Global Trade Survey Report. And it, uh, the subtitle on it, Expanding Roles for Trade Compliance Jobs and Technology. This is a report that you need to make sure you reach out and get uh, and, and talk about. And in looking at it, let me just say right now, uh, first off, both uh, Karen and Andrew, thank you so much for joining our show. Karen, you and I obviously have uh, known each other for a while and have seen each other and tag team at uh, different conferences, which has always been a pleasure. And uh, definitely, I've always been a, a big uh, proponent of the Boskets days and, and keeping my staff uh, informed and, and uh, uh, shall we say, equipped with the, the right uh, different books and, and, and resources. So, but uh, with that, uh, Karen, how is this uh, report being published? Is it just digitally? Is it uh, by email? Is it by your a hard copy? What? What do we got? First off, it's uh, it's available online, so it's digitally produced by Thomson Reuters Institute. Um, you can simply go to the Thomson Reuters website to the pages for Thomson Reuters Institute, and you can download it from there. That's the easiest way to get your hands on a copy. Um, it's available for anyone. There's no cost to it and um, certainly easy to get to. That's the easiest way. Everything's digital these days. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, Karen, the easiest way, just go down to our show notes and you just click the link. I'll, I'm going to put it on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that is that what is the whole uh, objective here of this? What are you trying to, to look at as, as you're looking at this different information? It looks like there was a lot of survey information that came through. So how did this uh, come about? This is, the, uh, this is the second year of publication. So last year was our first publication from Reuters Institute, which does quite a bit of, of work on the research side with case studies, publications, articles, and this particular report was designed to take a look at the global trade compliance, global trade industry, and really get a sense from the respondents, which, you know, there were, I think, 177 um, respondents to this survey. It's an online survey that has open text questions. It takes them roughly 15 or 20 minutes to complete it. And it focuses on a variety of topics. So it's looking at trade challenges for the global trade professionals, um, talent issues with regards to talent um, and skill requirements in these roles. Technology, of course, is a big topic to look at how technology is being used in this particular arena. And more recently with this year's report, they added in the topic of ESG and how that is folding into global trade professional uh, responsibilities and the impact there as well. But it's really providing an overall sense of what the market looks like for companies operating in this space, what their priorities are, where they're focusing their strategies in the coming year, what issues they're most challenged by, and and where they're investing both in talent and technology. All right. And when you're talking about ESG, you're talking along the lines of environmental uh, type things, correct? Everything in the spectrum, so environmental, social, governance, and clearly with respect to global trade management, global trade compliance, you know, that falls in a lot of those buckets. Everything from, you know, high profile forced labor under the social environmental concerns under things like uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms or deforestation and then governance, which clearly is just compliance as a whole, but people traditionally in the trade compliance space may look at it more in the areas of uh, things such as Foreign Corrupt Practices Act as a good example of that. But yeah, the full spectrum. There's supply chain security and data protection. It's like, you know, medium to high, you're looking at 96% of focus on supply chain security and data protection. I mean, the cybersecurity issues are huge. I mean, we just had at the recording of this just the previous day, three cell phone networks wound up getting, you know, uh, 
were, were down. Now, nobody said what the reason is behind it, but then simultaneous to that, you have the pharmaceutical industry that was uh, a victim of uh, a cyber attack. And so those kinds of things is going through is it comes back to what can you do in, in protecting your own thing. So that, that was interesting in, in your report of, you know, the, the investment in GTM and the number one thing seems to be more cybersecurity or supply chain security. Yeah. I mean, these, these stories are in the news and there's more of them every, every week, every day. Right. And so it's very front of mind that when you have, uh, when you have incidents like this, um, and especially in an age of, of social media and very quick, uh, mobilization of, uh, the narrative, these sorts of things can really can do damage beyond just what, what is the delay? What is the fine? You're talking about reputational damage that can take a long time to, uh, uh, to recover from. And you're talking, uh, about, you know, it can even be something where a, a story like that makes it harder for you to recruit people. And it, it exacerbates that existing, uh, you know, that, that existing other, um, issue and uh, pain point that we've talked about, which is the talent gap, right? So suddenly it's even harder to do that. It, it creates so many different problems that it does need to be a focus. And, you know, we're hearing from people whose careers have, have been long and have lasted through the Mod Act and have lasted through, you know, 9-11 and the, the shift over to the Department of Homeland Security and all that went with that saying that right now is, is the most challenging time because there, there are so many things to, uh, to keep an eye out for. Yeah. I think to add to Andrew's comments, which were great right on the, you know, hit the nail on the head with that. But I think on the, the security supply chain, security data, privacy protection piece, the other thing that I think is raising that up is one, there's, there's some new laws coming out in other countries, you know, like in China where you're, and in the EU where they're expanding on their data privacy laws. So, you know, there's attention to that to make sure you're compliant with the, as they continue to build those out. But companies are also having, as they use technology, they are storing more and more sensitive, detailed data within these systems in order to comply. A good example would be if you're doing due diligence for third-party risk management on your suppliers to the nth tier, and you're, you're gathering data related to compliance or ESG or forced labor-related issues, you're, you're gathering a lot of very sensitive data. And that data and that volume of data is a lot greater than it was 10 years ago. And the, the need to protect that data from a security standpoint, reputational standpoint, IPR standpoint is becoming a bigger issue. And I think that also leads into that. Why is this so high on, on the list of priorities? When we look at technology is, it's not just the technology that I need to be more efficient. It's, it's got to be, if, make me more efficient, but it better be secure. It's got to be secure. Well, not only secure, but backed up. That's the other thing is that, you know, and I will say, <clears throat> especially large companies and all that, there's always this idea of, yeah, we'll archive the data and all that. Great. But test that out. So go and see if you can find some specific data as what you were just talking about two years ago, three years ago, whatever, maybe even four years ago, and test your archive. It's like, yeah, we're, we're archived. We're backed up. We're great. Well, if you, it, it's like taking all the data and I've seen this so often. It's almost like it's dumped in a great big bucket and then you're supposed to pull out your information. If you can't extract out meaningful data, your backup doesn't do you jack. It's, it's, you've got to be able to, you know, not only put the data in and secure it, but extract that back out. And, uh, I guess with, with the data and everything that you all are, um, showing on the report, um, one of the things that, that I was, that, you know, as you all are talking about this is sometimes, 
And you're not going to have a choice. I mean, like Karen, you said about like your supply chain. I mean, how to to the nth tier? You said. I mean, yeah, you're storing that information, but with all the new requirements, for example, with uh, forced labor, that's a very obvious and very easy to to talk about. Um, how in the world are you without automation? How are you going to even come close to knowing who your supplier, 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 suppliers are? You know what I mean? Even down to you know what when when that was mined you know or 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 harvested you know cuz unfortunately that's how that's how deep customs is going if they're going to test your product you know and 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 there's new technology that that can test the let's call it dna of of that product you know the 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 where did was that cotton really picked in 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 the Uyghur region you know and and you don't know i don't know, you know it's i have a shirt you know that that's all i know that i brought in a shirt you know so um but based on that um and because of all that that, that y'all are talking about, is there any data or any information that you all see that are trending that are going to shape the future of trade i mean like what you might see like what may you see in the report next year you know what i mean like in in, 20, in the 2024 report what do you feel? I mean, I mean, it's I know it's like trying to look at a crystal ball, but I mean, is there anything, any indicators there that that might be pointing towards we may need to be doing this versus that now? Or I mean, I, I don't know if there's anything on there that that you might be able to comment on. Oh, Andrew, you want to take a crack at that? I mean, I oh yeah, I'll I'll peer into my crystal ball, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we can circle back in a year and and we can laugh at how how wrong I got it, but. I, I would expect to see um, I would expect to see a lot of these trends continue. But what I what I would really expect to see, and we've already started to see um, signs of this, is a growing, um, if not level of comfort, understanding that artificial intelligence is going to become a necessary component of the solutions to these things because. While AI has its limitations and we should be cognizant of them, it, the ability to, um, to sort through large amounts of data and, uh, to identify the signal in the noise is a strength. Um, and it's one that I think, you know, if we, if we were talking 10 years ago and we were talking 10 years ago about you know, artificial intelligence or things that were being called artificial intelligence applied to, you know, trade compliance. And there was a lot of skepticism then that I think we're, we're seeing less of now. And I think we're going to see even, even less of it in, in future years as we start to, as we start to test that. Um, Karen, do you, do you see anything else in the crystal ball? You know, that's the th top of mind. What came to me is exactly what you just said, is I think AI is going to be key in these discussions, especially with regards to talent and technology in next year's report. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch how it evolves, not only from its use, like where does it fit? Where is it being useful in the global trade space? Um, you know, where is it deemed acceptable? That, and by acceptable, where is it being uh, considered um, reasonable care by standards of agencies who you're having to comply with their regulations? Will customs in the U.S., for example, deem the use of classifying goods using AI as reasonable care when looking at complying with proper classification of your goods for the purposes of import. Um, but also, there's a lot we don't know yet with regards to the regulatory side of AI. The EU has the AI Act, which is coming going to be coming into force. The U.S. has the executive order that is going to ultimately generate legislation and regulations surrounding AI. Um, you're seeing this in other countries as well. Regulations are out there that are being formulated and AI is going to have to comply with those regulations. But right now, nobody knows what they, <laughs> what they are. So 
people are developing using AI based on, you know, very vague parameters when it comes to a regulatory compliance environment. And I think we're going to see those regulations start to move forward in the coming year. And it'll be interesting to see how work being done in the AI space with global trade management, as well as other technology solutions, whether that changes the direction they're going or where they focus their efforts. I think that's going to be very interesting to watch. Anything else that you would love to see? Uh, it's like, what would be, you know, after reading this, what would you like to see, Andrew, uh, that or suggest maybe some of the action that somebody should take if they're in any kind of leadership role? I think the first thing that they they should think about doing is um, either in-house or if it makes more sense with a consultant of some kind, create an impact report. Uh, based on, on where that positioning is and, and, and just, um, just to generate a, an understanding internally with main stakeholders, what's coming, how it, how it might impact, who it might impact, what areas and why does it matter? Um, and as much as you can get it into dollars and cents, the better. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll also say that, um, somewhat self-aggrandizing, but it, it wouldn't hurt to reach out um, and uh, to uh, software providers, right? And, and have a conversation about what solutions are out there. What is the needs assessment and, and what would the ROI be and, uh, and, and what can be done to, to help meet those needs? Excellent. I, I love that. And, and if, in, uh, let me say that if you're going to look at doing an impact report, um, and, and, and do an assessment that way, that report doesn't necessarily, you don't have to have all the answers. The question is, is are there any vulnerabilities that need to be furtherly, uh, further investigated? Um, and all that. So I, 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 and again, this report would generate a lot of areas. Of, oh, let me look over this way or whatever. Uh, Karen, how about from your perspective, any actions do you recommend? I, I would second what Andrew said. I think it's a tool to help you look at your corporate strategy, where you need to put your resources, where you may need to do further research before taking any steps. And uh, clearly in my mind, you know, the tech, technology is going to be key on any of these issues going forward. And having good communication with technology providers out there to learn what they can offer, where they can help in those pain points that your company has is going to be really important going forward. The timeline to move through um, evaluating, acquiring and implementing technology is not an instant thing. So the sooner you're having those discussions, ongoing discussions, because things change and enhance every year with software and technology solutions, but you want to keep those dialogues active because it's becoming more important every year as far as a tool. 